Texas Week with Rick Casey is made possible by the generous support of the William and Salome Scanlon Foundation, supporting educational, environmental, and Hispanic cultural initiatives. The John and Florence Newman Foundation, encouraging an informed community. The Daniel J. Sullivan Family Foundation. And visionaries like members of KLRN. I'm Rick Casey, and this is Texas Week. More than 30 cities across the nation have either passed or proposed ordinances banning the provision of food to street people in the past year. In San Antonio, it can mean a fine for high-class charity. We'll hear two perspectives from people who are well-versed on the homeless issues. Evan Smith, editor-in-chief of the Texas Tribune, joins me to discuss how the legislature avoided a temptation to tighten their ethics code. And in my last word, the perks of being kin to the president. Texas Week starts now. This week's most important stories, people, and issues in depth. This is Texas Week with Rick Casey. It's not just the Spurs who have made national news for San Antonio in the past week or so. Joan Cheever's food truck has as well. It's not because Cheever serves fine cuisine from her truck, and it's not that she serves good hot meals to the hungry, including the homeless, although not many food trucks do that. It's that after years of doing so under the friendly eyes of the police, she recently was cited by the police and faces a $2,000 fine. More than 30 cities across the nation have either passed or proposed ordinances banning the provision of food to street people in the past year. In San Antonio, it's part of an effort to regulate the homeless. Today, we will get perspectives on the issue from two people closely involved with Haven for Hope, San Antonio's ambitious center for the homeless. Former Councilman Robert Marbot, who now serves as a consultant advising cities around the country on dealing with homelessness, and former Councilwoman Patty Radel, who, in addition to developing Haven for Hope, also led Inner City Development, an organization on San Antonio's west side that, among many other things, provides food for the hungry. Unfortunately, Robert and Patty had conflicting schedules and couldn't appear together. We'll begin with Robert. Welcome, Robert. Thank you for having uh, me. You have, you've built a consulting company. You've been working on this issue for, for quite some years now after being the founding uh, president and CEO of, Home, of, of Haven for Hope. Uh, now, you, you have some issues with the kind of work that Joan, Joan Cheever is doing. Let's just quickly get those issues yeah, out. Yeah, and, and, and real quick, it, homelessness, you got to understand before we do anything, take a step back and what's our common goal? And I think our common goal should be recovery and to graduate from the street. And in order to do that, you need to understand the root causes of homelessness. And in the males, it's substance abuse, mental health, and job retention. And female, it's those three, plus you have to add domestic violence and economically hardship connected to divorce. Those are your root causes of homeless. It is not hunger. It's important to understand we have a real serious hunger problem in America, but that's not what this is. And it's a commingling, and the solutions are different. So is there a truck just serving the homeless, or is it serving no, the, the what, what, what yeah. should happen in is recovery is being in a 24-7 program. Because the far right has this idea, let's go jail everybody. That doesn't work. But the far left also has this idea, of let you hang out in a park bench and no personal accountability of recovery. And in my experience, I've now worked in 125 communities, and we've not seen any recovery really of any effect in a jail cell floor. And we've seen zero recovery out of, out of parts. Where you get recovery is when you're a program. So what I ask are the Joan Cheevers of the world is align your street feeding with your core root causes. And one of the best all-time food programs in, in America's history that started it all, DC Kitchen, they started out as a street feeding program. Then they moved to a dining room, and then they realized they weren't doing anything to move the needle. And so they actually created a substance abuse program inside their feeding program. That's what creates recovery. Now, it, you, you, are, you have seven guiding principles, and the first five deal with how to run uh, an, an institution like Haven for Hope various things that need yeah. to be done. Well, small or big, together. the scaling right. doesn't matter. Right. And uh, But the sixth one is specifically, uh, you, you say that external activities must be redirect, redirected or stop. Street feeding programs without comprehensive services actually increase and promote homelessness. Ab and that's absolutely are, are true. Are you real familiar with Cheever's program? I know that she requires them to drink vegetable soup 
before they can have any of the rest and of I don't the food. know and I don't understand yeah but she yeah. we were on a show the other day yeah. and she said that and I didn't ever ask it and got to ask the chance that's why it. why that's important but yeah you don't know what level at which she engages people no but but I do know it's once a week and that's one of the problems it has to be consistent it has to be 21 meals and Haven for Hope provides 21 meals uh -huh. uh, Salvation Army provides 21 meals Strong Foundation provides 21 meals there are a lot of programs the key that we do know in recovery occurs around 24-7 programs, not park benches and not jails. Now, there are two issues. One is that uh, Haven for Hope has about 2,000 places for, for uh, the full program. They have some right. programs that are less engaged than the full right. program. Uh, but they're and, and all programs. They're, 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 they're custom to the level of need for that person at that particular time. Okay, but there's, there's at least a perception among some people who work with with the homeless and the hungry, that there are many more than that, at least twice that, uh, and that we don't have the resource there. In addition to that, what, what they tell us is that not everybody is ready to go into that kind of a program. Uh, some people are just in denial or they've got other issues going on, uh, and that uh, a program such as Jones uh, can help serve those people who are not gonna be pushed into Haven for Hope. And, and what I ask is there's nothing magic about location. And, and what's magic is about the service being provided. And so there's no reason you couldn't move that truck and put it on the Haven for Hope campus, put it at Salvation Army, put it outside the front door. Uh, the other, other than we're a city of one point, what, four million people, pretty spread out. Uh, if somebody doesn't have any money getting from the east side, or we have a growing uh, problem of slums in the suburbs. Just getting to one in, in location, any place. Again, now we're starting to go from homelessness to hunger. There's yeah. a real life, true hunger, and the people that are real smart about hunger. And I'm not, I'm not one of the smart ones on hunger, but I, I look to the people who are really good at that. And what they say are point-to-point -point programs, like Meals on Wheels, are your best feeding programs. And you, if you're really going to make a difference, you have to do 21 meals. You can't just do one on a Thursday night. Okay, one more question. Uh, there are people who feel that. Part of the impulse here in a lot of cities is to hide the homeless and other problematic street people from tourism. I would not accuse you of that. And I've never done that. Have, but do you run into that kind of, you've been consulting with cities around the country, do you see that dynamic as, as part of the push against Oh, them? absolutely. And that's why the far right has this tendency to want to jail, but then they don't want to create any programs of recovery. You have to do... Whatever you do, you have to be getting back to the root causes. That's why I'm all about where the recovery occurs. It occurs in a 24-7 program. And the far right has a tendency to not want to fund those and just arrest people, and that just simply doesn't work. Likewise, the far left has this sort of idea of loosey-goosey, no accountability of recovery, let's go feed person and park once a week. That actually enables homelessness and doesn't help recovery either. They're both equally counterproductive. All right. Robert Marbet, uh, former head of Haven for Hope, former city councilman, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you us. for having me. Yeah. As mentioned, Patty Radel now joins us. Uh, Patty, uh, you were a key person, one of the leaders in founding Haven for Hope, and you've been vice chair of the board ever since. So you've been very involved with it, but you've also been involved for uh, 45 years on the west side of San Antonio, you and your husband running uh, inner city development. And among many things you've done for the community is you've had an active uh, feeding operation for uh, for hungry people, in, including some homeless. So you've got quite a range of, of personal experience on this. Now, Robert Marbet was on, and he also has a good deal of experience uh, in consults around the country. He makes the argument that for operations like Joan Cheever's food truck feeding the, uh, the hungry elsewhere can actually be an enabler, an enabler of keeping people out of homeless uh, places like uh, Haven for Hope and actually does more harm than good. So I'd, I'd like to get your response to that. Well, at Haven for Hope, we have tremendous services, and I believe that we pro provide those services in a very healthy uh, environment. And uh, the fact is, though, that we do have uh, capacity. We have limitations on how many people we can take care of. So how, and how on, many people can get the full service? Uh, the, the actual transformation center, which is was our intention of our big service, not just a shelter, but lots of services to help people transform their lives. We have a capacity um, but around 900, actually over that, it just depends on how many families and how many children are actually there. 
And in the courtyard, we have a capacity of about 500, which can extend higher than that, depending on how weather goes and if we use the indoor part. So that is um, below 2,000. And on any given night, by the count in time, we have between two and 4,000 people who are homeless in our city. Uh, and that is a limited count because it, it's impossible to count all of our, our homeless. Those people who are maybe homeless but living on somebody's couch or in the garage. So other services are needed. Uh, and how those services are provided are, are different and sometimes are dependent on uh, the compassion of the people that are involved and how they are available to provide services. Well, the kind of services we're talking about here for Hope include some schooling, some health-related stuff, drug, uh, substance abuse, counseling, and, and even working on helping people get jobs. This really is a broad range. It really is. The, the services are extensive. Even if you had unlimited capacity, would uh, it be reasonable to expect that you could push all the, the homeless or hungry people over there to get it? It's not reasonable uh, because in reality, a lot of people who are hungry are not homeless. And if you live on the east side or the south side or the, uh, near, even the near north side and you have children you're taking care of after school and it's dinner time, you don't want to have to travel all the way over to Haven for Hope uh, to get a meal. So uh, people who are providing meals for people who are hungry in other parts of the city are, are very important uh, to the services and uh, the compassion that's needed in the city to help take care of people in need. Well, I think there's one area in which you and, and Robert agree, and that is that you, uh, you talk about the need for engagement with the people as you're helping them. Tell me about what you mean by that. Definitely. I don't uh, think it's uh, enough really to just provide a plate of food, but it's, it's the conversation that goes along with that. The, the personal uh, engagement is uh, a re real key, I think, in any services that we uh, give to people. We're not uh, giving it to a, a non-living thing. We, this is a real living person who is like us, but for circumstances is hungry and maybe not having a place to stay and live. So the engagement piece is very important to help um, see if there's something we can do beyond a plate of food. Uh, is there a place we can f refer them to? At Haven, the services are right there. Other parts of town, it might be, as we do at Inner City uh, very often, because we do have people coming by for a sack lunch at the center itself. And we engage with them, we get to know them, and very often I find myself having them uh, get in my car and taking them to some place like Haven or taking them to some place that will get them services they need to become more uh, independent. So you're not just feeding them and, and you're listening and if you feel like they're ready, there may be people, if I understand, that maybe a year earlier or three weeks earlier might not have been ready to say, yes, I'll go to Haven for Hope. That's right. We've had people who've come to our center for years for a sack lunch and all of a sudden one day they're ready. And then also we need to understand that in the streets we have so many people, 30% I think is the number that's usually given, who suffer from um, mental illness. And uh, getting somebody to be stable and going to a place regularly is, is a challenge. And sometimes they just need something that they feel is not so confining in, in their sight. And uh, so some of these places, um, like what Joan Cheever is doing sometimes, you know, are a, a service that speaks to those kind of hesitancies that people have. Well, I, I know that Joan it has some level of engagement, and one, one of the things that she does is you have to you have to eat your vegetables, and in fact, drink <laughs> some vegetable soup. It's like our mothers used to say, eat your mm -hmm. vegetables before you get dessert, but before they get their meal. Do you know uh, whether she has a broader range of engagement? Uh, Honestly, I don't know uh, her range of engagement, but since she's been doing it regularly for so long, my guess is she's developed a relationship with people who come by there. You've seen some efforts towards a crackdown here, and we've seen it in other cities, and there's been a fair amount of publicity on that. Uh, there's something I asked Robert about, but do you see as one component of that uh, a concern that our own citizens and, and, and tourists uh, might be discouraged if you know, we don't want them to see these problems in the city? Is that one of the factors, do you think, in the efforts to? Well, I think it's some people's concern that they don't want to see people sleeping in business doorways. But I think it's some other people's concern that they don't want to see us not taking care of people who suffer. Uh -huh. and, and I don't think it's the city's position to stand between a, a person's compassion and somebody in need. But how can we figure that out? 
that is also respectful to business owners and people in the environment surrounding that helping someone. Can you speak to some what you would think reasonable ordinances? There, there are some concerns about homeless people and you know building camps under bridges or whatever. Uh, what would be those concerns and how do you address them? Well I think people who do engage in some services that they give to the homeless um, need to look in terms of ado adopting the whole package. You're serving the food but what else are you doing for that environment around there? Um, do you know what happens after you pick up your tables and food and leave? Is there trash left around? Um, have you asked for consideration of the people you serve to help clean the area and, and bring their attention to things that may be a bother to people in that area? That's the kind of engagement that is needed. Um, it's one thing to get engaged with somebody's issues and what they need to do to maybe help themselves more, but it's an, another thing to engage them in the service itself and be responsible it about is, the area. Does it make it any sense to have any kind of uh, penalty for the people who are actually providing uh, the services? Or even we've seen some proposals that even if individuals give a panhandler some money, that could be, that could be sanctioned. Well, uh, again, I don't I think it makes good sense to interrupt an act of compassion, uh, but I think we can give guidance to people who give. We could maybe encourage them to find an environment that is more friendly to the area where the people are in need. Uh, you know, people are watching that we don't think about. Our children are watching. Mom, how come you didn't help that guy? You know, what message is that? You know, she said, well, because I don't want to get a ticket. You know, uh, I mean, what kind of message does that say about our city? What kind of a message does it say to the little girl? Well, let's bring it down to the personal level. If I'm approached by a panhandler, mm -hmm. uh, he's got a story, you know, what, what do you recommend? Uh, what's a good response? Well, I think uh, ask him about a story, engage with him, talk to him, um, and, uh, you know, develop a relationship, uh, if, if, especially if it's somebody who's hanging out in front of your business or your area all the time. And uh, as I've told people, you know, that person is either going to be very happy that you bothered to worry about them, or if they're in this for the business and they're going to go get in their fancy car after they've begged on the street, they're going to move. Well, because, how about, how about uh, if they're a drug addict and they've just got business. a good story in order to take care if of they're their They're a habit. drug addict, and I, I think you just, uh, you know, make your own individual decision mm -hmm. and to what extent you're going to get engaged with that. Uh, because it's true, there are a lot of people there that will take advantage of the situation, but again you know listen to your heart that's that's probably good advice about a lot of things patty thank you very very much thanks for coming on okay All right. thank patty you. radel uh, vice chair of haven for hope a member of the san antonio school board and longtime uh, uh, head of, of inner city development on the west side thank you very much evan smith editor-in-chief of the texas tribune joins us from austin evan you had a birthday this week happy birthday Thank you very much. The governor, in his uh, inaugural address, uh, said one of the things he really wanted to see the legislature do was pass uh, ethics reform. And we've had right. a number of scandals It was, it was one of his big priorities. That's it, right. It was. So how's, how's that going? Not so great. Um, you know, the legislation that has been introduced in the, uh, uh, during this session on ethics reform is more like what my colleague Jay Root uh, calls ethics deform. It's not been a step forward, it's been a step backward. It's, uh, it's watered down. Uh, it's legislators, I don't want to tar everybody with the same brush, although I kind of want to do, but it's basically a case of legislators giving themselves uh, an out uh, to, to subject themselves to the kind of uh, disclosure that we all believe uh, and that they say they believe that they should be sub subjected to. They want to treat themselves by a different standard. They want to consider themselves a different class of, uh, of citizen. And they don't want to tell us all the things that we might want to know that would give us the kind of information that we need to determine whether they're acting in our interest or their own. It's, uh, it's a little depressing. Now, there's still time to pull this out and to make it better. But up, up to this point, the, the legislation that, uh, that they've been looking at waters down rather than strengthens or beefs up um, uh, well, ethics in the state. Now, the governor has said he will veto a tax cut bill that doesn't include a, a cuts in the business tax. Has he made Correct. any noises that he will veto a bill in the ethics area that doesn't come up to his standards? Well, that's a very interesting question. So the short answer to that is no as of now. You know, he has talked a lot about wanting ethics. He, in fact, I think he said at the beginning of the of the session, this is going to be the ethics uh, session. If you plant your flag in the ground, as he did, and say ethics is one of my priorities, if you say this is the ethics session, and the, and the byproduct of the work of the legislature is to go in the opposite direction from what you say, and you do nothing about it, 
that's a problem. Um, if the governor is serious about it, one imagines he will not stand for this kind of um, uh, uh, activity on the legislature's part and would veto or would really harangue in the last month, you guys haven't done enough. You know, Presumably, if there's a Senate bill and a House bill, they'll differ, that they'll go into conference. In conference, you can fix many different problems. And very possibly at that point, the governor says, I don't like either of these bills. Neither one does the kinds of things I want them to do. I want you to strengthen ethics uh, in, the, in the course of this conference committee. But uh, the reality is it's not trending in a good direction, and it will be up to the governor to decide whether he's willing to uh, accept that. Well, and meanwhile, we've seen a bill reported out. It, it was this, I think, approved. Uh, right. That, that changes the way that not just ethical uh, violations, but criminal violations are prosecuted when they involve state officials. Correct. Uh, correct. And, you know, the, the Public Integrity Unit has been the bane of uh, some... Uh, people's existence uh, uh, for, for many, many years. I mean, go back to when Kay Hutchison was, uh, was investigated. Ultimately, nothing became of it back in 93. Uh, but more recently, the PIU, Public Integrity Unit, has become uh, be better associated with Rick Perry's um, uh, current uh, uh, legal situation. Despite the, the ironic that fact that they were not to. involved in his, in, in his uh, indictment. Uh, of course, they were not the ones who indicted him, but it was sort of that's where the sort of origins of it were in the Travis County DA's office where the Public Integrity Unit has been housed. Right. And the controversy is over the fact that it's in the Travis County DA's office. What the legislature has wanted to do over, at, over time at various points is move the investigative powers of the Public Integrity Unit to the Attorney General's office or to the counties or to the Texas Rangers. What, what they've done, though, um, uh, with the two pieces of legislation, House and Senate, is to is to ultimately uh, uh, treat themselves and other high elected officials by a different standard than somebody else who's alleged to have done something wrong. It, it, it is in sync with the ethics uh, deform in Jay Root's parlance, uh, a step in the eyes of some away from tightening up what we expect of public officials in the area of ethics and corruption. Have to see whether before the end of the session things change. Well, I know that you, like I, am shocked, shocked. Evan Smith from the Texas Tribune. Thank you, Evan. Thanks, Rick. We've set up a link to the Texas Tribune website. Just go to kln.org slash Texas Week. We'd like to hear from you. Email us at texasweek at klrn.org. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And now, the last word with Rick Casey. The New York Times last week told a story from the early days of the first President Bush. It had to do with a trip made by son Jeb Bush and his business partners to Nigeria. They had gone to promote their flood and irrigation equipment, but the reception they got was worthy of a state visit. For five days, Mr. Bush and his associates were chauffeured through major cities. A crowd of 100,000 locals cheered them at one stop. Governors paid for lavish receptions in their honor. The Nigerian president invited them into his office. There are parts of the world where relatives of the president are considered royalty. For Jeb's kid brother, Neil, it was in Asia. The embrace was more private than Jeb's and more intimate. I learned the story when I first went to the Houston Chronicle and obtained copies of documents from a bitter divorce Neil was seeking. By this time, Neil's brother was president, not his father. Still, he was royalty. Exhibit 24 in the case file was a contract given to Bush by the head of Grace Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. The company had opened a $1.6 billion computer chip plant in Shanghai, and the contract called for Neil Bush to attend the company's board of directors meetings, not as a director, but as an advisor. In a separate exhibit, Bush admitted in a deposition that he had no knowledge of the microchip industry, but he said he had a master's in business administration and considerable experience in Asia. Now, up until that point, Bush had made his largest mark on the business world with his performance on the board of Silverado Savings and Loan. The failure of the Denver institution famously cost the federal government more than $1 billion. Federal regulators assessed Bush's performance as engaging in, quote, numerous breaches of his fiduciary duties involving multiple conflicts of interest. He was fined $50,000 and barred from the banking business. But to Grace's chief, Winston Wong, Neil Bush was worth $2 million in company stock, plus $10,000 for every board meeting he attended. Wong was generous to power. He previously had paid $50,000 to have a cup of coffee with President Bill Clinton in the White House. In the deposition, Bush also admitted that when he was traveling on business in Asia, he would sometimes get a late night knock on his hotel room door. A beautiful woman would greet him and then come in and 
make him happy. Bush said he didn't know the women, never saw them again, and paid them nothing. Asked if they were prostitutes, he said, I don't know. I suggested that maybe the women spotted him in the hotel bar and overcome with lust, bribed the bartender to get his room number. Yes, and maybe Grace contracted to pay him $2 million in stock for his wisdom. The column went viral. British tabloids especially loved it with headlines such as Hotel Sex Claims of Bush Bro and Brother is as daft as is Bush, whatever that meant. The New York Post headlined Brother Bush a Babe Magnet. Jay Leno cracked, and today Clinton said, what was the name of that hotel? Harper's Magazine, CNN, and the Associated Press asked me for copies of the contract, and Playboy wanted a copy of the sexy part of the deposition. They promised a free copy of their upcoming 50th anniversary issue for my help. I told them I had a policy that I accepted no small bribes. It would require at least a Playmate's knock on my hotel room door. Which Playmate, the editor emailed back. I let it go at that, but mentioned it in a subsequent column, and the wonderful Carmina Danini, who has since retired from the Express News, messaged me, I recommend Miss October, 1956. And that's it for Texas Week. See you next time. Texas Week with Rick Casey is made possible by the generous support of the William and Salome Scanlon Foundation, supporting educational, environmental, and Hispanic cultural initiatives. The John and Florence Newman Foundation, encouraging an informed community. The Daniel J. Sullivan Family Foundation, and visionaries like members of KLRN.